today we are going to visit the Potteries Museum and Art Gallery in Stoke-on-Trent which is my mum's hometown and we're going to have a look around and see what they've got so we'll see you there so inside the museum first thing we've come across is this Dalek I'm glad it's not real that would be interesting to sink plunge <laughs> That's our Dalek. So in here we've got some of the Staffordshire hoard. So these are some of the sword fittings. And fittings from Anglo-Saxon knives are also present. They did very well from the Staffordshire hoard, didn't they? Yes, they did. Here we've got some parts of helmets and some of them are really really tiny and there's a replica helmet that's been made there and it's this helmet was fit for a king We've got some more things from the hoard here because many objects were torn apart before the treasure was buried. This damage often reveals how they were made. Smiths made gold supplies go further by using thin sheets over non-precious cores. Silver was sometimes gilded to give it the appearance of gold. And then here we've got a replica of an Anglo-Saxon hall, the Mead Hall. And it says wooden Mead Halls were at the heart of pagan Anglo-Saxon settlements. They were places of feasting, storytelling, law-giving and oath-taking. Loyalties were forged over ale and mead, a drink made from honey. Some halls were decorated with carvings and tapestries. Warriors sat on benches around a fire pit. So here we've got the benches. They've got a boar skin there on that bench. There's the fire. Out through the door there, they've got their secret garden. So we just have a look through the window. So I imagine that's quite a pleasant place to go in the summer. It's that little garden just surrounded by the walls of the museum. As we're in the home of pottery, here's some early pottery from Anglo-Saxon times from late Saxon times actually, the late 8th to early 11th centuries. This is a major late Saxon pottery industry flourished in Stafford and archeological excavations carried out have gathered evidence of this major industry. So here's some examples of the pots that have been discovered from that time. Shows how well pottery lasts, doesn't it? Ages and ages. Some prehistoric pottery. Which was mostly hand-built either from a piece of clay, which was pinched into shape, or from coils of clay joined together. Here there's some burial urns. made from pottery obviously. So here we've come to Roman times and it said the Roman army marched into Staffordshire three years after the invasion of AD 43. Staffordshire was then a region of dense forests and bleak moorlands with a scattered population along the fertile river valleys. The local tribes were soon brought under Roman control. Across Britain, a series of forts and roads were constructed to help them maintain their dominance over the British people. Settlements grew up close to forts, which later developed into towns, built on a regular grid plan. In Staffordshire, Roaster, Chesterton, Wall and Penkridge all developed close to military forts. Agriculture flourished under Roman organisation. Wealthy farm estates emerged, each with a Roman-style farmhouse or villa at its centre, although most still lived very simply in villages. Industry also developed with pottery making, lead and silver mining and coal extraction flourishing locally. 
the Romans stayed in Britain for about 400 years until attacks on the Roman Empire from barbarian tribes became so fierce that the Roman government was compelled to withdraw its troops. The government of Britain collapsed soon after the Roman withdrawal. Here we've got some kind of artefacts that they would have had in Roman houses. So this is from a Roman kitchen, so they've got olives, some pork, grapes, complete with mouse that's in there, and spiced wine to accompany the meal. Here we've got some personal adornment stuff like brooches, and rings, necklaces, hairpins, and here we've got some examples of Roman games, board games. And these are some examples of Roman graffiti where they've scratched on the side of pots. A few miles away from here, there's the remains of an abbey that was called Halton Abbey. And archaeologists unearthed more than a hundred graves within the abbey church. Some were in wooden coffins, a few were decorated with stone grave slabs. Some people have been buried with symbolic objects, such as wooden staffs and lead badges. One grave had a, wa a wax seal from Rome. This is an example of some of the tiles that I guess were found in the abbey. And some of the, the graves. And then there's some pictures of them there. So it said, after the dissolution in 1538, the abbey buildings fell into decay and it's likely that local people took the stones to build walls and houses. By 1800, the abbey ruins could still be seen, but within 50 years they disappeared. However, building work disturbed remains including walls, pillar bases and human bones and there were rumours of lads kicking schools around and monks being discovered buried upright. So here we've got the kind of kitchen area where the whole family would have lived and spent, and spent all their time. So they've got the sewing machine for the mum there. There's the range cooker there with the pan on and the rocking chair by the fire, which I guess is where the man of the house would have sat. And then there's the kitchen table. And there's different pans for doing baking and chairs around it. Baby's high chair. And there's the cupboard where they just stored food. And then they've got clothes hanging up and drying over the fire. These two rooms, because next to it's the wash house, are typical of a 19th century terraced house in Stoke-on-Trent. Often families of more than 10 people lived in houses like these. The kitchen was also used as a living room. Families would eat their meals in here. The tin bath was brought into the front of the fire and the whole family would take turns to bathe on one night of the week, often Friday or Saturday. So this would have been how my grandmother lived because she grew up in a terraced house with her mum and dad and there were nine children and they also had her grandmother living there. So there had been 12 of them living in this tiny space. And then this room here is where they do the washing and it was an all-day job done by women and they'd wash bed linen, underwear, table linen, shirts, blouses and children's clothes. The water would have been boiled in the copper at the back of the scullery and then ladled into a dolly tub which is here. Pre-soaked clothes are then scrubbed at the sink there and then put into the dolly tub, which is there. Clothes were rinsed with clean water. The last rinse contained a bright blue powder called dolly blue. This made white washing look very white. After rinsing, it was put through the mangle, which is there, which squeezed out lots of water so the clothes could be hung outside to dry in the wind. And there's the tin bath hanging up on the wall there. 
here's the fish and chip shop with the fittings from about 1923. So we can see the friars there. There's the newspaper that they'd wrap the fish and chips up in. That's where they'd have got the chips from. That's how they'd have cooked them, kept them warm with the oven there with the fires. And here's the counter where the customers would have been served. Here. And it tells us on the slate there that fish was 2D, chips 1D, peas and chips 1.5D, tripe one shilling a pound and four fritters for one day. Lauer is known for his matchstick men and matchstick cats and dogs. That's a Lancashire farm. There's one of the coal barge. The road over the hill. There's one here. Uh, it's called the Empty House. courtyard. I like the pink house behind it. It's a, a large picture in the barber shop. That's really good that is. Do who painted that one? It's called Short Back and Sides and was painted in 1958 by William Bowyer. William Bowyer who painted this has been described as the most famous unknown painter. He worked at Sneed Colliery, Burslem, as a bevin boy during the Second World War and attended art classes at Burslem School of Art. My grandmother did. Oh, well, they might have known each other. No, he was younger than her. In 1945, he was accepted by the Royal College of Art in London. So this is the replica of Barlaston Hall. And Doll's House replica of Barlaston Hall. And they've got the kitchen and some room, living rooms on the ground floor. And on the first floor, they've also got some, looks like a formal drawing room there. And one there and then on the top floor, they've got bedrooms and a bathroom. That's a big doll's house. Here's a model of a bottle oven. So there's the whole thing. And then it's got the side cut away so that you can see inside. And then it's got another cut away so you can actually see all the saggers stacked up. Remember, we learnt about those at Gladstone. So they've got all the saggers stacked up. And then they've got a little man down there who's uh, firing it up. That must have taken a ton of time to build. Yes, yeah, uh, quite an intricate little model, that is. And here, this massive peacock. That's another Minton piece. So that's me told that Minton didn't just make tiles. <laughs> that is really, really ornate, that peacock is. Wow. And that was from 1873. We've also got some more pieces made by Minton. Very, very ornate. There's a giant pottery fountain. It's made by Minton. And then on the floor here, we've got an example of what Minton's really well known for in my book anyway, are the tiles. I just love Minton tiles. This is from about 1860. There are some missing, but just the skill and the artistry that goes into the tiles and you put them all together, it's brilliant. We're back from our visit to the Potteries Museum and Art Gallery. It's free to get in, although they do ask for donations if you can spare the cash. Parking-wise, there is a multi-storey car park nearby. 
and if you've got a blue badge there's limited parking on the roads nearby as well it's quite easy to get around there's lifts and so on to take you to the different floors there's the ground floor first floor and lower ground floor however if you're visually impaired and you do have some vision you might find it's a little bit dark for you to see which is understandable for some of the exhibits but but some of the hallways are a little dark as well it is interesting and I enjoyed looking at some of the art and and some of the pottery dating back quite a while so it was an interesting couple of hours I think I hope you've enjoyed this video if you have please click the thumbs up button and if you don't already please hit the subscribe button and then you'll never miss one of our videos again thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time bye